All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Maritza Adonis, and I serve as the chair of the Young Lawyers Interest Network for the American Bar Association's Section of International Law. Today, you're joining us for our first in many upcoming programs entitled In the Field, Charting Your Course in International Law. As you know, the field of international law is exciting, invigorating, and there's so many paths that you can take, whether you're serving as in-house counsel, working at an embassy, working on diverse issues, your clients are diverse. And so our goal with this program are a, a couple areas that we want to fulfill with this. The first is that we hope to inspire those of you who may be pre-law students, law students, LM students, to enter the field of international law. We also hope for our young lawyers or even our seasoned lawyers who are thinking about making a transition. Hopefully after hearing our amazing speakers today, you're very, very excited and you see yourselves in one of them. And most importantly for us in the section, we want to create a safe space for you as you go through this entire international law journey. So hopefully you guys are really excited. You've come with many, many, many questions for our distinguished guests today who took time out of their busy schedule to share a little bit more about their path and to hopefully inspire you to join the field. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, and give a deference to one of our senior advisors, Judge Mernan, if you're on line with us, if you'd like to just provide us um, just a sh quick short greetings um, on behalf of the senior advisors of our of Yin. Over to you, Judge Mernan. Thank you so much, Maritza, and good morning to everyone who's joined us from around the globe. You're about to hear some really exciting insights uh, part of what Maritza and her team at the Young Lawyers Interest Network are making available to you to help chart your own career path. We want to thank all of the speakers who joined us this morning and encourage you to um, share as many insights as you're comfortable with and even a few war stories that can help them navigate the pathway that you've undertaken. Uh, and I see some laughs and smiles because every every career path has a few bumps. I've been a member of the ABA for almost half a century now, really seriously. I come to you this morning from the Republic of the Marshall Islands, where I'm an associate justice on the high court. And what I really need to tell you is um, I've been all over the world, the international legal practice can be so exciting and you're actually going to hear it from some first-hand individuals who have given generously of their time i want to thank you on behalf of the young lawyers interest network and the senior lawyers interest network which partners with young lawyers to try to make sure that we can provide those career tweaks to make sure that you get to where you want to go thank you again and maritza thank you so much and i'll turn it back to you Thank you, Judge Renan, for being an outstanding supporter and champion of Yen and young lawyers across the ABA. So with that, I would like to introduce our first distinguished guest, Ms. Zainab. She is the partner that many of you submitted amazing questions for. So I'll share a little bit more about who she is. She's a partner at the International Dispute Resolution Practice of her New York office. She is dual qualified in New York and Turkey and has practiced in both jurisdictions for more than 10 years, advising clients at all stages of conflict resolution, especially on investment treaty and commercial arbitrations across a diverse range of sectors, including construction, agriculture, oil and gas, and telecommunications. Zanab's experience includes arbitrating proceedings under all major institutional rules, including ICSID, or the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, the ICC, or the International Chamber of Commerce, and the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, also known as UNCTAD. She began her legal career as a transactional lawyer, advising clients on corporate and commercial transactions, and fostered her reputation representing sovereigns and state-owned entities in arbitrations involving the CIS region, the Middle East, and Europe. Zainab has written several publications on international and Turkish law and was recently invited as a speaker at the annual conference of the ABA section of international law. Welcome Zainab and thank you so much for joining us today. 
Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Our next distinguished guest is Joy. Joy is a blockchain advocate who combines her background in international law, finance, and Web3. You have to tell us what is Web3, Joy, to service the needs of evolving tech landscape. She's passionate about inspiring, educating industry leaders on the potentials of blockchain technology. And she also finds her drive in engaging audiences in novel dialogues through leading Web3 seminars and developing purpose-oriented blockchain-based initiatives to create impact. Joy is dedicated to fostering a culture of service through involvement in various charitable organizations and educational initiatives, actively engaging with the community to empower and inspire individuals to take a leadership role in the blockchain industry. She has a focus in international business and decentralized digital asset protection and serves on the board of multiple blockchain-based companies. Welcome, Joy. Last but certainly not least, Mr. Tyler Holmes. Tyler is a senior program officer at the American Bar Association Rule of Law Initiative, also known as ABA Rolling. Before joining the ABA, Tyler was a programs lawyer with Irish Rule of Law's Access to Justice Project in Malawi. Very cool. His work involved advocating within and engaging the Malawi Police Service on matters of legal compliance, especially in pretrial detention of suspects and proper treatment of children. Tyler also previously volunteered with the Southern African Litigation Center in Johannesburg and was a trial attorney based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Tyler is an active ABA member, volunteering for the Young Lawyers Division, Wild D Magazine, and serving as co-chair of the International Law Section's Africa Committee and Wild D Director of Legal Innovation. Welcome, Tyler. Thanks, Maritza. You're very welcome. So with that, let's get started with one of our key questions that I know all of our attendees are wondering, and if you've heard me talk about their amazing resumes, and oftentimes when our students, our young lawyers, even our transitioning lawyers will hear the bios, sometimes they can get overwhelmed. And oftentimes they don't think it's something that they can accomplish. It's usually something that's aspirational, but not actually applicable for them. So can you maybe walk us through your journey in the field of law and humanize it just a little bit. And you can talk, you can start from the very first moment that you realized that you wanted to become an attorney. So we do want to hear your, when I was 10 years old, I decided to become an attorney story. Um, so I'll turn it over to Joy. You can just please share with us your journey into international law. And we okay. definitely want to know what in the world is a Web3. Okay, well, let me tell you what Web3 is first, because that's the easier story. Um, so Web3 is the newest orientation of what the internet looks like. So when you think about the development of internet services, when you think of Web1, which one of you might not have, you know, ever experienced Web1, depending on your age, um, it was static HTML pages. You would pull up a website and then nothing would happen. You would look at whatever content was on there and that's all you had. Web2 was the ability to interact with things on the website. Web3 is something that we see is a live interaction. So think about uh, live videos on your social media. You're able to actively interact with the user as the user is creating content. And so that's what Web3 is. And so Web3 is this more engaging version of the web. And so it's the evolution of the web. That's Web3. Um, it gets more complex when you think about the uniqueness of Web3 and what assets exist uh, on the internet. And that's where the you know definition gets complicated but for all for everyone's sake we're gonna spare the nitty-gritty okay so i got into law international law very differently and i wanted to be a lawyer as a kid but i come from a more traditional background um so it was going to be medical school or nothing um so i went to undergrad i uh, decided medical school was not for me was um then I was decided to pursue, I, I was pursuing a military career. And so with a military career, I wanted to have some form of doctorate role. And so it was going to be medical, it was going to be a chaplain, or it was going to be law. Um, I got kicked out of the seminary. So that didn't happen. Two weeks, it took them two weeks to kick me out. And then I ended up in law. And in that meantime, I picked up a couple of other degrees that were oriented towards international studies. And I had a business background, entrepreneurial spirit. And along this way, me getting kicked out of schools here and there, left and right, I decided to start up a couple of companies. 
And with that, I had more of an experience in international business, not so much on the legal side just yet. And then I had an interest in technology, and that was something I focused heavily in when I was an undergrad. And those fields almost married themselves as I was studying the way to preserve the wealth of my clients from a business perspective when they were involved in blockchain. And so that's what it is, the decentralized finance asset protection is basically if you have a whole bunch of digital assets, such as crypto coins, such as NFTs, such as uh, tokenized securities of whatever sort it might be, or interests, how do you preserve those on an international level when you have different securities laws across the world and there is no really cohesive or one jurisdiction that might be more favorable than the other? And so I was in law school, finished up law school. Um, I'm actually, for students that are, you know, I'm, I'm actually fairly young. Um, I'm actually going back to school in the fall. Um, I'm going to get an LLM in internet law. It's time for that. I'll be over in Italy if anyone's coming from Italy. Um, and uh, the big thing that I want to emphasize about my career path is that I knew I wanted to be a lawyer, but I was apprehensive towards it. And uh, it took all the cutting of all these options where I was like, yes, this is my calling. And here I am. That is incredible. Um, I love your story about getting kicked out of seminary school. You'll have to Maybe we'll probably need to do another series just on that, you know, the very place that lawyers got kicked out before they decided to become attorneys. Um, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. And also for sharing um, that your journey is still ongoing. I think that's really important for our attendees to also hear because sometimes, again, when we have these programs and they meet so many great dynamic speakers, they're thinking, okay, this is my end goal. It's going to take me like 25 years. Maybe I won't ever get to that part, but this is truly a journey, which means it, it can shift. It has its ups and downs. It can be green one day and red the next day. And so, you know, just thank you for sharing that, that it's it's ongoing and we're sure there's tons of Italy folks in our network that we can connect with you after today's programming so that you can have a good support system when you move there to study. So I'll turn it over to you, Tyler. Tell us what is your journey into law? Um, <clears throat> so a little, perhaps a little more straightforward to getting into the law. So I think, you know, I was, I was looking at the, the questions you had outlined and, um, my answers, the first couple might be pretty boring. Um, so I, you know, I'm, uh, kind of a typical political junkie, someone who has always been interested in, in public service. Um, and so always anticipated going into, going to law school and having the legal degree for, for the perspective of, of running for public office. Um, and I actually ran for uh, the Kansas House when I was 18. Um, so going to law school was a pretty, you know, straightforward um, aspect um, of kind of my development. But um, the wrench was getting to law school and realizing that I didn't necessarily um, didn't necessarily want to know or know what I wanted to do in terms of uh, of a concentration, um, what kind of, what kind of focus I wanted to have, um, and so it, part of my undergrad and kind of exploring what was in, of interest to me um, in, involved travel um, for the first time, international travel for the first time. I had not left the country until I was nineteen, um, and I had an internship um, at our embassy to Malawi. Um, the a um, couple of months in between graduating from undergrad and starting law school. And that really kind of reset um, what it is that I wanted to do with law school. And it, it took some time to figure out how to apply that. Um, and uh, though that at that time, it was a concentration in um, you know trade and investment, uh, the commercial aspects of international law and practice. Um, what I ended up doing was, was, you know, finding a way to kind of learn how to be a lawyer, get my legs under me for a couple of years, and then, um, you know, being able to self-fund the, the, um, the fellowship, I suppose, um, to show, you know, that this was something that I wanted to do in earnest was be abroad and, and work on issues that were, were related to other, you know, jurisdictional contexts. So, um, a little short, but yeah, that's, you I mean, 
it was a pretty short journey for me to get from, you know, always going to law school and just um, the concentration of, or trying to find the focus of, of what to do with that, um, what, what kind of application I wanted to have um, when I kind of realized that I didn't want to immediately, um, you know, run for public office again as a 20 something, uh, I wanted to get real world experience, wanted to be able to, um, to explore um, a lot more than, than just uh, going straight into the politics. Short story, short journey, Tyler, but incredible. Um, the politician route, that's incredible that you already had that foresight and you said, okay, if I'm going to enter politics, I need to become an attorney. Although you did run at 18, you weren't quite even in college yet, but I think it was that you definitely kept up with the plan at least because you obviously went to law school, you became a lawyer and you practiced. Um, so that's really, really interesting as well, too, because we get to, and later on when you talk about some of the work that you do now with the ABA, you know, sometimes people are thinking, I need to take this cookie cutter step to becoming a lawyer and international law looks like this, but your story just shows them that you can go for your, towards your passion first. And if it connects with the law, it does. If it doesn't, you can still find creative ways to connect it. So sorry, although short, but very, very sweet. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Zaina, we would love to hear your journey into international law. Absolutely. Um, so mine was a bit winding, I would say. Um, first off, I practice international arbitration um, and I'm Turkish American. in the international space since I can remember, since I was a child. It serves as a literal and figurative bridge between East and West, you know, Europe and Asia. And it's where my family's from. It's where I spent a lot of time growing up. And I really wanted to, as I became an adult, I knew that I really wanted to maintain a connection to the region. Um, I never really had this sort of aha moment when I was 10 that I want to be a lawyer. Rather, a lot of people told me that I should be a lawyer when I was a kid. I was actually just telling one of my uh, one of my associates uh, whom I work with this, I think like yesterday, I would just sit with the grown ups and just like participate in conversations with them and talk a lot and try to dominate those conversations. And so very often people would say, you talk a lot, you should be a lawyer. And it ended up happening, I guess. Um, I don't talk a lot, I would say, but um, in any event, um, as I got older, I knew I wanted to, you know, stay connected to Turkey. I saw the impact that international law had um, in that region. And, um, you know, I should also add that when I graduated from law school, it was a bit of a challenging time. It was the height of the economic crisis. There were not a lot of international law positions at law firms. Um, and I applied for jobs abroad. And I focused on Turkey in particular, because I'm a uh, a national. Um, I will add, though, candidly, that I'll never forget one of my advisors at my career center in law school said, Dana, you should you should really consider international arbitration. You know, you have this international background. You speak a few languages. You're you, it'd be a great fit for you. And at the time, candidly, I did not know what arbitration even meant. And I said, oh, OK, sure, whatever. <laughs> But in any event, I got a job at one of Turkey's law firms, moved out there after taking the New York bar exam, was placed in the M&A and corporate department, and basically focused mostly on cross-border deals and serviced a lot of foreign clients, um, a lot of investigations, You know whether they complied with uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and other US securities uh, regulations. Um, that kind of thing. And then a few years later, I was actually recruited to join a US law firm's Turkey or office in Istanbul. And that was a big game changer for me. That was a very pivotal moment in my career. I could have stayed at the Turkish law firm where I was very happy, uh, but I would have been pigeonholing myself to be sort of just a Turkish lawyer practicing international law, but really just as a Turkish lawyer. And I didn't want to limit myself that early in my career. So I took this opportunity, I moved to the US law firm, and I still maintained that corporate work, that regulatory and corporate work. Uh, but I was uh, introduced to the wonderful world of international arbitration there. And that changed everything. I don't want to go on, I could say a lot. But basically, I will add that 
you know, there is this big difference between the legal education in the U.S. and in most of the rest of the world, not everywhere. In the U.S., it takes a minimum of seven years to become a lawyer. And uh, in Turkey, for example, it's just four. You just go to college and, you know, you, you basically you earn your, your legal degree. Whereas in the U.S., we come out seven years later, we're more mature, we're, uh, we have more life experience. And that really worked in my favor. Uh, in the international uh, law and arbitration space in particular. Uh, I was given a lot more responsibility than my peers. And uh, I, I relished that opportunity. I got to go to so many hearings. Uh, I got to do a lot of investigations and travel and stuff that I don't know that my my younger peer, because they were younger than me, people at my level in Turkey, uh, they didn't really get to do that right away. They had to earn that a few years later. In any event, I eventually moved back to the U.S., switched law firms again, and I'm still practicing international arbitration. That's incredible. Um, thank you for sharing that story. I love how you talked about um, being able to, you know, merge your culture with your profession. I think a lot of times our LM students, especially when they're coming to study um, here in the States, they sometimes feel pressure to assimilate into the American way, the American culture, and they don't really, they haven't really found a way to leverage all of that training back home, you know, the cultural competency that they can bring even into the American legal classroom, even into the American legal profession. So I love that you kind of gave a little bit of what that can look like, even, you know, given the example of your opportunity to work at a law firm in your home country and being able to still come back home here in the States, which we do have that as part of our membership. So we have um, American attorneys who are went to school here, JD, barred here, but then decided to go overseas and work and live. And so it's really good to see that we can do it all. It just depends on what we want our journey to look like. So thank you for sharing that. So part of the journey that, uh, it's one thing to go through the journey, but it's an entire different thing to actually take the necessary steps in order to get to these places in the journey. So before you can even work for a law firm, um, at the level that you're at, Zainab, you have to go through several different credentials. So can you maybe talk about, you know, different bars that you have, you had to take, what it looked like working in Turkey, were there particular documents you needed to fill out or additional training you needed to get? Can you maybe share with us a little bit more about the credentials aspect of your journey? Did you want me to start? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. So uh, in terms of credentials in the U.S., pretty straightforward, I would say, you know, after undergrad, go to law school for three years, then you take the bar exam of whichever state you want. Uh, I did New York because it's generally um, the one you do if you're planning on going into international law. Uh, and then moving to Turkey and getting certified in Turkey was incredibly challenging, much more challenging than the process in the U.S. for me, not for, I think, uh, uh, your average Turkish uh, national. I had to, first of all, I didn't have to do anything. I could have just maintained my JD and my um, New York certification and insisted on just maintaining that. But no, the Turkish law, law firm where I work insisted that I become certified to practice law in Turkey as well. Um, you know, I hated them at the time, but I am grateful for that now. And what that involved was a pro an equivalency process. I had to take, I had to apply to certain approved law schools. And uh, once I got in, they decided how many courses I had to, I didn't have to take the courses, but just sit for the exams. Uh, that was really hard because I had studied in the common law jurisdiction and um, Turkey is a civil law jurisdiction. So I had to take 13 exams. And while I grew up in a Turkish household and I was fluent in Turkish, I never received reading and writing, formal reading and writing training. So I kind of like taught myself how to read. And, I mean, I kind of knew already, but you know, I, I never had that formal training. Uh, I miraculously passed all the exams and uh, then I had to do a year long uh, stage, it's called, which is internship. It, there's no exam, so that's nice at least, not like a bar exam, but I had to go to the Turkish court, sit in uh, and observe, which is fascinating. It was, sometimes it involved proceedings that were close to the public, criminal proceedings. And uh, then I also took uh, additional courses at the Istanbul Bar Association. Then I had to do a thesis. And all of this is viewed as pretty 
pretty easy for Turkish law students. Not for me. I was, I really had to push myself. I was also working at the time. And I think what really got me through it is my colleagues and peers. They, I mean, it was incredible. They stepped in, they shared their old, you know, course notes with me. They helped me with my thesis. They helped me do practice presentations. It was just incredible. I mean, they really, really guided me through the process. And I don't think if it wasn't for them, I don't know that I would have passed and done all of it in, in a year's time. Incredible. So note to all of the American law students, you cannot complain about the bar, right? <laughs> it sounds like the process was much more challenging in Turkey, but I think it's each its own, right? It's one of those things, depending on what you're trained on, it's what you, you're, you're you're taught to sit for the bar, like we are here. I'm pretty sure they're also taught to sit for the Turkish bar. And so taking those 13 exams is just part of the process. So it's it's challenging from our perspective, for sure. And I'm sure when, they, when they're here, they're also like, this bar is pretty tough. This American bar is pretty challenging. Um, but thank you for sharing that because that's a question that we get quite often is what does it look like for me as an American attorney to qualify in a foreign jurisdiction? And we often get the question as well too, if I'm a foreign attorney, how do I get qualified in an American jurisdiction? Tyler, I know that you are qualified here in the United States. Can we talk about some your credential story? Again, pretty straightforward. Um... You know, um, finished law school, um, passed, um, were you fortunate to finish law school, you know, at the beginning of this era of the UBE, right? Um, and so able to, to take um, the Missouri exam and uh, by the time I needed it, about a year, year later, uh, being able to just wave my score across into Kansas. So pr practiced in, in Kansas City for about two and a half years and, and needed to practice in, in both states. Um, so pretty straightforward. Um, the work that I've gotten to do abroad um, has fortunately been in circumstances or contexts where I'm not, you're not actively pro uh, practicing, right? You're engaging in research, um, certainly having conversations about national laws um, and writing memos or contributing to pleadings, in fact, but um, doing so in support of a local lawyer who's going to end up filing the matter. So um, one of the first things I got to do um, with with volunteering at Salk, for instance, was the Southern Africa Litigation Center was research um, for a filing on um, an uh, the terrorism exception um, or an exception to a freedom fighter exception to a, um, an anti-terrorism law um, in a case that was before the um, the Constitutional Court in in South Africa, and so. You know the nature of working um, or contributing to a, a, a nonprofit that was an amicus in the case, and um, you know has the funding to be able to brief the um, the barrister right to make the arguments, but is you know contributing to the the actual pleading that's filed before the court. Um, you get an opportunity to you know do really interesting research and turn around and go to court and listen to. Um, listen to, to, you know, in that case, the uh, members of the Constitutional Court, justices of, the, of South Africa's Constitutional Court, engage in the, in the arguments that you were making as a team. So um, I've gotten to do that in a few different kind of contexts. Um, I've been very fortunate to do so um, without having to qualify to practice elsewhere. That is really exciting. I know for a lot of our attendees, um, especially for those that might be in transition, who are wondering, who may, or maybe have taken the bar exam and didn't do well the first time, and so they're probably bummed out and they're saying, oh my goodness, I haven't passed this bar. There are no other options for me. Um, hearing your story was really interesting because it, it provides an alternative um, that you know anyone can take. And even if you are barred, you might decide and say, I don't want to sit for a non-UBE jurisdiction state. I'm not taking another bar, but here's an opportunity that I can still work on. It could be a, a research focus role where I'm still supporting um, the attorney and I still get to do legal work um, without necessarily having to get an additional credential per se. So that was really exciting to hear. And fun fact about UBE, I don't talk enough about this, but 
one of my colleagues and I, Chris Jennison, he's now one of the liaison to the House Delegates. So proud of him. We are ABA geeks. So we started as law students 10 years ago. And one of the things that we did when we served on the Board of Governors of the Law Students Division was to actually start the UBE campaign. And so we were the two law students that went to the state of New York and really just petitioned them to join the UBE. And we were successful during our term in seeing that. Um, and that created the ripple effect for so many more other states um, to join the UBE. So when you guys are taking the UBE, it's shout out to Chris and myself that just were just the zealous law students that said, we do not want to sit for a gazillion bars. And another side fun fact, our respective home states, Kids of Maryland and Florida have not joined the UBE, so help us, please. <laughs> we're successful in getting every other state, but the states that we really wanted to, to add to that list. But just wanted to share that. And since you brought the UBE story up, um, Joy, share with us your credential story. I know that you're uh, en route to obtaining your LLM. I know there's a lot of students on here that might be interested in or thinking, should I even go get an LLM? Uh, but talk to us a little bit more about your credentials and what it has looked like for you on your international law journey. Yeah. So first, uh, thanks, Martisa, because I took the New York UBE, um, and uh, that's made my life easier, for sure. Um, so uh, yes, the, the so my my journey into law school is a little bit different. I ended up graduating from University of Little Rock because of the military. Um, that was a public school that was in the area where I was at, and so that's where I was. Um, and I honestly, I felt a little bit disheartened because I was coming from other law school opportunities that would have automatically opened up international law to me much more. Arkansas um, is much more family oriented. And so there's a lot of trust, wills, estate planning, and that's the emphasis of education there. And it wasn't until towards the end of my graduation where I guess I kept bugging the professors and I kept forcefully writing papers on topics that were non-traditional. And that's how I started engaging. And the ABA played a major role in that. I got involved in the ABA when I was in law school as well. And that's what shifted the gear for me, where I was like, okay, just because this is where I'm here now doesn't mean this is where I have to necessarily stay. And that's why I ended up going to New York, where I had grown up. I'm currently in New York. Um, and I work for fully virtually. I refuse to work in the office just yet. Maybe that'll happen one day, but not yet. Um, and uh, being in New York, you know, they say your location of where you live is going to be a determining factor of what you pursue in life. And that's true. It's very true. And, you know, Zainab took the New York bar for the same reason. It's just the place you want to be if you want to go into international law. And so that was my decision, the same concept. I decided that I wanted to go ahead and do an LLM. So I'm going to Italy, I'm going to Bocconi and it's going to be internet law. It's a relatively new LLM program, relatively, um, but it's a wonderful school. It's an amazing school. They have a great business school as well. And, you know, for me personally, it was kind of reminding myself that I'm capable of achieving bigger things. And again, uh, I'm still in my law school, like, like learning journey. I, um, I like, unlike more seasoned lawyers, I have kind of the plethora of options that are still available, whether I want to go to corporate law, if I want to go back into the military as a JAG, um, or if I want to uh, pursue this like entrepreneur aspect of internet existence. And, uh, you know, one thing that I'm also studying for right now is the patent bar, uh, because I keep coming across a lot of like NFT and AI questions, and I'm kind of tired of telling other lawyers to do it, where I'm like, maybe I should just go ahead and do this myself. Uh, so that's another opportunity for students to look into. And you can get, uh, you can pass the patent bar while you're in law school, before law school, if you have a bachelor's in some science background, um, you know, computer science, biology, whatever it is, or if you've taken certain classes, you can go ahead and be a patent agent. Um, that the patent bar is harder than the actual bar exam. So I've heard, I don't know yet, I can't speak to it. Um, but it's open book and i'm saying this because i was not like financially stable in law school and it would have been awesome if i was filling out patent applications and making a couple of hundred dollars every hour <laughs> right 
So um, credentials wise, I think your journey is going to be what you want it to be. Um, and, you know, there's this strange push that we have seen in the past two, three, four decades where the concept of determining your course in life as far as your career goes was set in stone. But we are also at a turning point. And I come from this from an inter internet perspective, like from this concept of in engagement with media and internationally, where we're realizing that someone like me who's basically a digital nomad and I can do law from, I'm headed to Spain in two weeks. I'm gonna go live there until I have to go to Italy, right? And it's kind of like, you are, at this beautiful place in civilization where you can decide what your next step is. And just because someone else has not done it yet, just because you're in a place that might not support those ideas or you're thinking too far down the road, doesn't mean it's going to limit you, right? And you know, Tyler ran for office when he was 18, right? There's, there's, there's no set course, it's yours. It's yours that you set. And so don't be afraid when you decide to Take one bar over the other, do a UB, don't be, do a UB, take a year off, do your LLM first, do your, you know, do a science, a judicial sciences degree, whatever it is, um, be a JAG. And uh, just just take the, just do it, just do it. Yeah, I mean, I, that's what I keep telling law students is just do it. That's how I ended up where I am. You just do things. I love that just do attitude. And I, one thing that you also mentioned that was, um, that took with me was that you said, I'm not going into an office. And I've been talking to some of my team members post COVID because I, I work as a lawyer lobbyist. So I do a lot of international rulemaking. Um, and when DC kind of shut down a couple of years ago, we were like, how can we do our jobs? Because everything centers around us going to a federal agency building or going to Capitol Hill or going into an embassy. But then we figured it out along the way. And we just had a couple of meetings where folks are like, I'm not coming back into the office. Like we need to bring the embassy to the screens. <laughs> we need to bring things to the screens. And so that's been a big shift right now and just the labor market generally. Um, so when you said that, I said, oh, okay, I guess we do need to figure things out because Joy is not coming back into the office. And so is probably 50% of my colleagues. We need to solve this problem. Um, but what's really, really exciting else that you talked about was the patent bar. I think that's something that's worth note worthy because when we think about the bar we we when you say bar even if you're not in the united states people think american bar immediately right um but there's there's so many other bars that you can take and usually we narrow down the avenues that we can go into international law and even the terms like public and private international law are always being thrown around and used interchangeably and when we think about it we say let me go and work for an agent, a, a multilateral organization like the UN, or let me go work for the um, International Criminal Court, or let me go work for ICSID. Um, and you gave us some really good examples on, wait, there's other, I can still pick a substantive area of law and do that internationally. And here's what it looks like. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And in that same vein, um, I'll stay with you, Joy, if you want to, you know, share a little bit more about other avenues that you've seen? I know you've been really tailoring your specific lens, but as you're exploring maybe other colleagues, you're seeing other avenues that they're taking. Are there any other really cool avenues that you know our participants can consider in the field of international law? Yeah, there's a lot. So, <laughs> um, so patent is one of those things. And you know, I like, I speak multiple languages. Um, I didn't realize this was a useful skill until I got a lot older and then I was like, oh, I can ease her up. Um, and I, you know, one thing that I think, the, and you know, politics aside for whoever, um, one thing that I would like to share is that when we think about U.S. political jobs, um, whether that's the military, whether that's being some federal agent, whether that's going into an agency as a associate, um, you are opened up to something that is inherently international and it gives you a direct avenue to pursue something. That dialogue may not exist in your environment, but you can make, you can start creating that dialogue. And for me, that's really what policy work looks like when it comes to blockchain initiatives is that the internet is inherently international. It's very hard to think of it 
as something that is limited. You know, even when you go to countries that have limitations on their internet or have firewalls or whatever it might be, the information communication system that we live in, it crosses countries, it, cro it crosses borders. And, uh, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge to explain it from a legal perspective because one thing that I've learned is that the way that my background is formed is that I very distinctly learned tech from a perspective. I learned um, social dynamics from a very, like from another educational perspective. And then I learned law from a completely different perspective. And then I saw these things start merging together. And it is the marrying of fields that develop new opportunities. And so when you think about like, I don't know, people have social media. If you think about digital content creators, and you think about photos that are used in one country and how they're going to relate to another, just because they're on the internet, there is an aspect that you have to think about like data privacy laws. You have to think about, you know, and you, and you have to think about the protections that don't exist in the United States, but they do exist in other countries. And especially with data, data mining. And if you have a area of interest that you've just kind of run as a hobby, for example, whether, you know, so if you sit around and you like to play video games or like code video games or whatever it is. Um, I coded games when I was an undergrad. And then I realized, oh, this code that I'm using has value in it, right? If this was to go to another country, this other country could be benefited by it. And so now you have this business transaction, right? And so, you know, it's, it's law exists everywhere around us. And one of the big things that COVID I think has taught us and uh, being involved in this tech space has taught me is that the way we look at law tends to be retroactive, right? When we think about, uh, for example, right now, cryptocurrency is being heavily regulated in the United States. It's not so much regulated in other countries, but our regulations are very retroactive where there are lawyers that have experience with security laws and other aspects of um, the SEC, and it's a retroactive regulation. It's not thinking about how is this on the forward facing end, right? And, and that's unfortunate because that's the way we've approached law. And I'm a big advocate for changing that dialogue. I think we should look at law and these developments in society, whether it's how in people interact with social media, how they interact with people from other countries, how they interact with digital, digital assets, we should look at it on the forefront. And if it's not going to be lawyers that make that dialogue begin, you're going to have individuals that are specialized and we're going to be stuck doing this retroactive regulation all the time. And so as far as it goes with other avenues, um, if you see something that the law doesn't currently address, there isn't a reason it shouldn't address it. And so talk about it, um, you know, tell it to your professor and like, hey, I wanna write an article. That's what I did. I wrote a ton of articles when I was in law school and then someone picked one up and was like, oh, she sounds like she knows what she's talking about and I'm here. So. Don't don't like hesitate on that. If you, um, you know, especially with the patent bar and and you no know, mentions of other bars. If you want to have specialization, you and have that credential, look online and see what else is available. Patent bar, I emphasize a lot because IP, in my personal, it, you know, in my personal opinion, is very interesting. I love it, uh, especially with like AI and stuff. I think it's funny. Uh, I think it's fun, and I think it's funny. But um, it's very cool, and you get to work with really awesome people. I've I've worked with artists and I've worked with like graffiti artists and I've worked with, um, I say all the time, thank goodness that I have friends that are like in the art space because I get to do all their IP work and I get to go to all these museums and cultural events uh, across the world. And I'm just hanging out here typing up documents on my laptop. So it's, you know, your, your career is going to be what you cultivate it to be. So look online and ask people around you and post in the forum, see what you can find, because you might find something that you didn't know you wanted to do. Incredible, thank you for sharing that. Um, Zainab and Tyler, are there any other professional avenues that you've seen come across, or maybe that you've taken specifically that you think our participants should consider? Tyler, we'll start with you. Um, well, I mean, as Joy says, the universe is um, for what you can do. From, um, in international comparative law is, is wide, it's broad. Um, I will say, you know, the world that I currently inhabit is, um, has this, 
you know, development focus to it. Um, it's not necessarily working for a multilateral um, as an employee, but certainly you can consult for one um, uh, or consult for a multilateral or, or a, a, a nationally funded um, uh, project or program, right? Um, so um, <clears throat> most of what uh, the ABA is funded by is our U.S. government projects um, in countries all over the globe, um, working on all sorts of different aspects of improving um, justice systems and the rule of law that have downstream effects on, you know, any number of um, different aspects of society, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be thinking about courts and um, criminal justice. Um, it can be about um, employment law and women's access to capital um, is one project that, that I provide support from uh, or support to here um, with the ABA um, that's based in Eswatini. Um, there is, you know, on the tech side of things, there is, a, you know, an effort um, for us to um, be engaged in programming that relates to the regulation of various uh, emerging technologies. Um, trying to work within um, multilateral institutions to, to, you know, or with various um, countries to improve um, their regulation of those sorts and structures. So there's opportunity to be a lawyer, you know, consultant working on all sorts of different projects, you know, U.S. government funded, EU funded, um, <clears throat> UN funded that engage, um, you know, in legal reform or, you know, more efficient um, function of uh, the justice sector all over the world. So whether it's, you know, you're motivated a bit by like I am or was um, to buy by place and just looking for an opportunity to contribute um, towards, you know, um, legal work in a particular part of the world, or if it's about uh, a particular substantive matter, you know, those those opportunities are, are pretty um, wide ranging. I also think that you know, based on my interactions um, with some of the biggest firms, uh, you know, in the world is that, you know, if you develop, you know, if you cultivate an expertise, not necessarily one that's recognized by a particular, um, you know, uh, credential, um, as we talked about, um, you know, the patent bar or something like that, but, but it, just an expertise in a particular area, you know, again, geographic area or substantive area or a combination of both. Um, I think you, you can find that they're either, you know, uh, firms or businesses that are, you know, persuadable to give you an opportunity to explore those areas and create a practice area, um, where it is emerging or, you know, not apparent, um, you know, from an, an online search into what people do. So um, there's a combination, uh, you know, in my mind of lots of opportunity that are formalized and lots of opportunity that you can create for yourself. Thank you for sharing that. I love the potpourri aspect of being able to create something which is really empowering. And it's usually, it's actually contra contrary to what we've learned in school when it comes to I want to go into international law. I have to work for either private, we're well, not private. If it's private, it's going to be a law firm, and it's usually an international arbitration or a related field. And if it's public, it's going to be one of our um, international criminal courts and multilateral organizations. So I love that you gave us a potpourri option, which is really exciting for us to consider. Zainab, do you have you know one or two fields that you've come across that you've entered yourself or did you see that's trending that our participants should consider in the field of international law? Um, you know, I do, but I also am, am aware that we're running low on time. So I think we've kind of covered the gambit here and, and you know, it's up to you, but maybe I thought, maybe do you want to move on to, to another topic? I mean, I think we've covered it. So it's, it's your call. Otherwise, sure, I can contribute. Yeah, so you can maybe contribute one and then maybe as once you're done doing that, maybe tell us a day in the life of what it looks like to be a partner. Because one thing that's also um, interesting for us to understand is um, what does it actually look like, right? It's one thing to enter into these different areas, but it's a whole other thing to work day to day. And Zainab actually gave us this really, really great question, which I think is a very poignant one. 
And it states the career international law is oftentimes viewed as almost as fashionable. So how would we say the work in the profession compares to what it may seem like from the outside? So you maybe can incorporate one of your ideas in there, but we really want to learn about a day in the life from you. Sure. So I would say, I guess, private sector, right? I mean, we kind of all touched upon it, but that is that is one of the most popular options uh, when you want to go into uh, international law at a law school. Um, and pros and cons to that, uh, I don't need to go into those. <laughs> Everyone knows, you know, the benefits and the disadvantages, uh, especially given the time constraint that we're facing right now. So I would say that indeed, when people think of international law, at least in the private sector, they think of things like, or people like, you know, Amal Clooney, for example. Obviously, that's not reality. Um, I mean, it is for her, um, of course, but it's it's not for anybody that I know in the international legal uh, field in the private sector. Uh, basically, you know, when you go into, when you start working for a law firm, you got to hustle, you got to prove yourself. Uh, these, this is all, I think, uh, common knowledge. And uh, moving up the ranks, uh, the way that you do that is by, first of all, getting as much exposure to as many people as possible and to as much different types of work as possible, proving that you can handle responsibility, honing those skills, taking initiative, demonstrating leadership. You know, these are all typical benchmarks that are that are um, sought after. And then, you know, in most cases, uh, you need someone to sponsor you to make partner. And, when, and I'm talking about the big law firm setting. So it's, it's, it's very different if you are a smaller law firm or if you are, for example, you know, a lateral changing from one law firm to another and you already have a book of business coming with you. In my case, I didn't. Uh, and so I needed someone to sponsor me, to sort of put me out there and to vouch for me, essentially. And, uh, and uh, the partnership accept, uh, accepted me. And so I started as an income partner. And then the goal after that is to move on to equity partnership. A typical day, I would say, is uh, very diverse. Uh, it involves work, actual drafting, actual research. Uh, and as once you become partner, a little bit less of the legal research being done by yourself because you can't really justify your rate, your billable rate to the client. Uh, so it starts taking more uh, the shape of delegating those tasks to your team, to your more junior associates. They don't have to be junior associates. They could be senior, mid-level, junior. But And that's really a skill in and of itself, delegating, managing a team, making sure that everyone is sort of uh, working together the right way and giving them feedback, whether it's uh, positive or, you know, a little bit more on the critical side. Uh, you know, a lot of business development also goes into the equation when you make partner. That's a little bit more challenging if you are in investor state arbitration, which is the field that I'm in, uh, because a lot of people don't have governments in their pocket as clients. And so you have to pitch, you have to literally bid oftentimes for, for cases, uh, especially if you're representing a government, a sovereign, which is actually my specialty. I mostly represent uh, states or government agencies. Uh, I will leave it at that. Maritza, I think you sent around a, a message. Okay. Uh, so I think that's that covers it. Yeah, that was great. Um, and especially the insights about what it looks like to work in a law firm setting, a book of business. No one taught us that in law school. <laughs> so you gave us some really, really good key terms for us to, to go back and do some additional research on to see what it actually entails if we want to go to law firm route. So that was extremely, incredibly helpful. Um, and I just wanted to do a quick housekeeping. We'll take just two questions from our audience. If you would like to ask a question, you can use the hand raising function at the bottom of the screen, or you can just um, put it in the chat box and we will extend for another 10 minutes exactly to give our speakers an opportunity to answer their, their last couple of questions. And with that, uh, you guys have talked about your amazing journeys, but we know that every journey has bumps in the road. So we'd like for each of you to share in just under a minute, a challenge that you face on this journey and how did you overcome? And we'll start with you, Zainab. Sure. Uh, so challenge, I would say, um, you know, there's so many. It's, it's really not just limited to one. 
the one that comes to my mind right now since we were talking about since i was talking about my experience abroad i would say that that sort of cut both ways for me on the positive side i got so much incredible experience so much more than my counterparts the kid the the folks that i graduated law school with who were stationed in the u.s at law firms in the u.s i was in turkey my billable rate was low i was thrown a ton of work and once they saw that i could handle it they just kept on giving it to me and yeah of course i mean it sucks <laughs> to be so busy at such a young age when you're supposed to be exploring life and you know back back in my day work-life balance really wasn't even a thing nobody was going around talking about it and um you know it was definitely something i would think about but um no it wasn't an actual term and there certainly weren't seminars and conferences about it but in any event the negative i would say was i was really sort of tucked away in this little satellite office abroad uh and because of turkish legislation i wasn't even on the firm's website because turkey tries to protect uh it's it's local lawyers and so they don't want foreign law firms coming in and doing the work that a turkish lawyer could be doing by the way if you want to become qualified in turkey i forgot to mention this earlier you actually have to be a turkish national uh so it's not like a foreigner can come i've seen a lot of foreigners come in get turkish citizenship and then become certified to practice there but in any event being tucked away uh allowed or, or did not allow me to make a name for myself in the field and international law is a small field you keep running into the same people and uh, no one knew who I was, even though I was doing very high level work. Like I mentioned, going to a, to, for example, an investor state arbitration hearing just once is gold. You get so much experience. Usually they last for two weeks and it's just, you walk away with a ton of skills. I mean, it's, and, and junior lawyers don't all get, always get to go to those types of hearings. Well, I was going because I was cheap. I was, uh, you know, it didn't take a lot to pay me. So I was there doing the grunt work and learning and um but i didn't get to attend conferences i didn't even know i should be doing that i didn't get to join any associations uh you know and other types of organizations i didn't even think about that i could be applying to be an officer of you know certain uh, arbitral or international law related clubs i uh never publication wasn't even on my radar i didn't even have time for it and i didn't unfortunately have someone who came to me early on and said, you should be thinking about these things. You need to be building your brand. And unfortunately, that worked against me. So when I came back to the US, I had to work double time, double time to do all of that, to play catch up, to bring myself up to that the level where I should have been if I had stayed in the US and worked in the same field. But I'm also carrying a heavy workload. And so it, it really was a bit of a sacrifice and it was challenging. Um, so I would say it's important to, of course, work-life balance is so important. And that's another one of the challenges I faced. And if we had more time, I would go into that. But another one is you, in this field, you have to balance the work against your brand. You got to do both. It's not enough just to focus on the work, I would say. That's a challenge we don't hear a lot about. You know, what does it look like after working overseas for an American trained attorney and having to reassimilate back into the legal field in our country? So that's very, very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. And obviously you have climbed over this challenge because you're now a partner at one of the top law firms. So congratulations to you. And thank you for sharing the journey itself, because again, a lot of our attendees are might be somewhere along that journey maybe they just finished school or maybe they're working overseas and they don't they can't find a way out to come back and assimilate and so hearing your story and seeing that you reach the the highest you can reach at a law firm partner is incredible so thank you for sharing that um while i have you i'll also ask you to give us one tip to our attendees as well too just in an interest of time if you knew then what you know now what would that be me again? Yes. Uh, I would say be nice. Be nice to everybody you work with. Not just your colleagues at, at, at the law firm, but random people you meet at a particular, you know, conference, uh, you know, in-person conference, of course. Even if what they do, it doesn't really interest you, even if it's something totally foreign or alien to what you're doing and you're not even aspiring to get into that field. Be nice, be genuine. You will keep running into these people and it pays off to make those connections. I mean, it's, it's I guess it's networking, but it's, I think it's more than that. 
I think it's about developing relationships and solidifying bonds. Oh, that's a great one. I don't think we've heard that one yet. And that's very important, especially in our field. It's relationship driven. And so if you're nice, you get so much more done. You get the client referrals. Um, you get to have really cool colleagues in the field. Thank you. Joy, two shot question for you. Share with us a challenge you've overcome and give our participants one tip. If only you then what you know now. So we'll start with your challenge first. Okay, so I know a lot of law students have thought this at least once in their career is um, everyone's just making up these rules and then you have to study them and then take a test on them. So that's my active life because internet law is new relatively, you know, the internet's relatively new. Blockchain, cryptocurrency, blockchain, you know, Bitcoin came out in 20, 2008. Uh, all this stuff is new. So every day I'm, you know, hoping not to get sued um because i'm just making up these rules <laughs> and hoping they're right and so that's a big challenge it really is and i think my background leaves me feeling imposter syndrome a lot that's a very big reality of my life um i have a really awesome mentor that told me uh recently you know you have these three opportunities in front of you right now you can either continue and do this military you know go back go go in and be a jag um or you can uh, can go into this corporate avenue that you're, you know, semi pursuing or go on full time entrepreneurship with this stuff that you're doing. And uh, he noted that one has full stability and one has a very low likelihood of success. And it's what you put into it. And then that was it. And that was my deciding factor. I was like, okay, if I'm going to commit to something, I'm going to commit something full faith. And that's the person I am. So big challenge. Um, it never gets easier. Um, but you have to stick to your guns. So do that. And one tip that I have, and I guess that is also the tip, but I want to reemphasize what Zainab said. Be nice to everybody. And it, it mirrors what she said about building a brand. I, at a very early age, was told that I have a very unique brand. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a thing. And part of it is being nice to everyone. I, for example, meet a lot of people through my legal, uh, you know, things that I do, legal things, work that I do. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like an everyday thing. I went to this like John Wick experience, early screening, and this is another perk of being a, in the legal field. You get free tickets to stuff from clients. Um, and I met this lady there, and now I have this huge network that has opened up because of her. And in New York, people are not nice to each other, but if you are nice, you'll you'll just learn more. And you know, when you're young and when you're early in your career, you get to pick everything. You gotta pick everything to do it. Just pick stuff. I, I know I know it sounds silly like as a piece of advice, but you know, I think we're so stuck and so scared to take these risks because we don't know how it's gonna end up or because no one else has done it. But that shouldn't be a reason why you don't do it. That's incredible. And especially um, as an entrepreneur, uh, you're CEO of Defy Legal. Congratulations. Um, hearing that you took the road less traveled by, especially in our field, it's, well, actually, I take that back. It's not less traveled by per se, because um, solo practitioners is has been around forever in our field. So we're used to um, entering into that space, but your space is a mix of legal and consulting. It's a little bit of everything. It's dynamic. So that's exciting. Um, so congratulations to you for venturing out and paving a way for so many of us that might be thinking about what does it look like to use my law degree in this innovative space. So thank you for sharing that. And I'm loving this tip about being nice. I strongly believe in relationship being the most important currency for the human race period. Um, and it starts with being nice, which is the easiest thing that we can do. And so I love that you um, supported Zainab's tip for us, something you wish you knew and then that you know now is just be nice. It opens doors and gets you free tickets from your clients. <laughs> um, Tyler, we want to hear your obstacle. What is one challenge you face on your legal journey? And tell us how you overcame and close us out with your tip. One thing you wish you knew then that you know now. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll actually um, be very quick, but um, say a couple of challenges. One, you know, to work in international law in a sense for good, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, usually requires you to um, have wonderful 
credentials, right? Um, which you um, probably can't get without having the means to, you know, not be paid doing something, right? Um, I mean, it, it, it's just a reality. Um, you know, graduate from an Ivy uh, League school doing public international law work, and the you know their funding with their endowments, um, their their graduates being able to go have a fellowship for a year or two, um, and so there there is a cost. I went and worked for free. I, I had that benefit, um, uh, you know, coming from a, a an advantaged background and being able to. Um, live with my folks for a couple of years and save money so that I could uh, pay for my own fellowship, create my own fellowship. Um, I think the second thing that I've encountered is that our, our, our profession, despite the fact that you go to law school to learn of a way to think about um, the law and, and interpret the rules that we set for our societies. Our profession likes to pigeonhole you into an expertise. You practice in, in this way and you're going to continue to practice in this way. Um, and so I would say that, you know, you will, you know, whether it's by geography, as Zamp's talking about, or by, um, by su the substantive aspect of your practice, you're going to have folks that are going to say no to you changing from one type of practice or substantive area to another. Um, if you try to pull it, uh, you know, pull that kind of a change um, at various points in your career. Um, and it's not necessarily easy to do um, or to navigate, but would encourage folks to, to keep going. My tip would be um, on networking. I, I feel like um, certainly when I was an undergrad and a law student that um, networking seemed like this thing that was, you know, unattainable. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of hustle. It was um, uh, causing other people um, to use their time on me. And so why would they necessarily do that, respond positively to a cold call, a cold email, what have you? Um, and I would say that, you know, in my experience, um, though this is, you know, sometimes bandied about, you know, that the worst they could say is no, or the worst that they could do is not respond to your email, you know, that's true. Um, and so feeling the confidence that networking is not this thing to be mastered, but rather simply you reaching out to people that you think are interesting and might have tips or experiences that can support, you know, what you're interested in doing um, is something to not feel, you know, nervous or anxious about. It's something to just kind of go through and, you know, send the message, have the conversation and, you know, go from there. Thank you so very much, Tyler. And with that, I would like to thank Zainab, Tyler, for your amazing contributions today. Joy, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your journeys have inspired myself. I've had opportunities to work in a little bit of everything that you guys have talked about today. Um, and my biggest takeaway is that the journey is still ongoing and that I have the liberty to shift it as necessary. I should op be open to try new things. I should get additional credentials if I find it necessary, like Joy. Maybe not get an LLM. Maybe not get an LLM. But I will think about getting additional credential. Um, or just diversify you know, my portfolio, like Tyler, who has opportunities to work on rule of law and diplomacy matters. And earlier, Joy talked about you know, the, the simple fact that we get to be an American attorney working in anything in law makes it international just naturally because of the very nature of us being america and the responsibility that we also have um, to the globe and as attorneys we're in that special place to not only protect and defend our laws but to protect and defend democracy across the globe um was very much inspired by zainab's journey to you know having been trained in, in the united states going to a foreign country and learning the entire process, doing very well, and then coming back and learning, relearning our entire process and reaching the very, very top um, at a law firm was extremely amazing. And so I hope all of you that's joining today, wherever you may be in your journey, whether it's your pre-law student and you weren't sure if, if the law field was for you, take it from Joy, 
you know, get kicked out of seminary school, law is definitely the place to go. <laughs> Joy, I hope you're okay with us poking at you with this one. Um, you know, the, the the world's your oyster when it comes to our fields. And if you're in school right now and you're very you're worried about the next steps, like what do the credentials look like? Um, I want to take the American Bar. I do want to invite all of you to attend um, our upcoming Pathways session that we're hosting just for LLM students that will focus specifically on the New York and California Bar. You do not want to miss it. You'll hear from many other who were in your shoes, who were foreign students, came to the US and they were able to crack the bar. And if you're just looking to find a place in ABA where you can, whether you're a law student, a seasoned lawyer, practicing lawyer now, and you're just looking for really good friends and good colleagues so you can bounce ideas about international law issues, international law jobs and opportunities, or international law conferences, we invite you to join the Young Lawyers Interest Network. You can send us an email at abailsyln at gmail.com, or you can follow us on our LinkedIn page. We want to thank all of you today for joining us. Special thank you once again to our senior advisor, Judge Mernan, for joining us from the Marshall Islands. I want to also thank my entire team, Kelly, our immediate past chair, who also joined us from abroad and overseas, Maria Goretti, Ty, who's our vice chair of um, programs who helps us make these programs work. Lubitsa, who does a phenomenal job with our membership and marketing these amazing programs and so much more. With that, I bid you all farewell. Continue to stay safe, take good care, and join us in the field of international law. I'm Maritza Donis, and I serve as the chair of the Young Lawyers Interest Network. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>